to do a redo. Um, I'm not sure how many elements I've lost track in terms of trying to count of what elements of the last Blue Ribbon Commission we ever implemented. And so I am looking to the new director to be a visionary and a leader, to do their assessment and analyze what they see, what they bring to the table, what information they need to be effective leaders, and look at perhaps one of the analysis or audits that have already been done of their department to figure out what elements of those need to go forward. Um, timing is an issue, as it was communicated yesterday by the commission. This report back is in 90 days. Um, you know, we certainly hope to be far along our process in terms of hiring a new director within that time frame. So how about we let the new director come in, establish themselves as the true leader of the department, and do what they think is best in terms of how they want to receive information, communicate their vision and leadership to their staff by framing um, uh, an analysis as they deem appropriate, and engage in a consultant that they deem appropriate. I just think we are putting the cart before the horse um, and engaging in an expense that could potentially be duplicative if the new director comes in and wants to engage in what as well. So with that, seeing no further hands raised, item 16 is before us, moved by Supervisor Barger, seconded by Supervisor Hahn. To approve this item, Executive Officer, please call the roll. Item 16, as revised by Supervisor Hahn, is before you. Supervisor Solis. Yes. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Kuhl. No. Supervisor Kuhl, no. Supervisor Hahn. Yes. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Mitchell. No. Supervisor Mitchell, no. Motion carries, three to two. Thank you. Moving on to item 17, improving justice data in the annual Greater Los Angeles Homeless Count, held by Supervisor Solis. Supervisor Solis? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I also want to thank Supervisor Kuehl for joining me as my co-author on the motion today. With the board's commitment to care first and jails last and through discussions with many stakeholders, including those impacted, by the legal system, we have gained, I believe, a deeper understanding of the intricate connections between homelessness and the carceral system. Housing can be a critical resource for preventing recidivism or diversion, yet often housing provided to formerly incarcerated individuals is found outside of the county's formal homelessness system. And to ensure we have the right resources to bring the care first jail last vision to fruition, we need to continue growing our understanding of the overlap that intersection between homelessness and the carceral system and the individuals that are impacted in that intersection. The county's annual homeless count is a great way to start. The Los Angeles Homeless Service Authority, LASA, conducts an annual homeless count to gather information about the unhoused population in our county. And every year, the county and community volunteers, along with service providers, outreach workers, and university partners, count the number of people experiencing homelessness. They collect that demographic information and data on the prevalence of substance abuse, mental health, and domestic violence among the county's unhoused residents. The results, though, of the homeless count are used to help inform our policy and funding allocations to address the region's homelessness crisis. Back in 2019, LASA published a fact sheet on justice involvement among the homeless population based on that data that they counted that year. The fact sheet showed that 64% of the unhoused population had been affected by the criminal justice system, which is no surprise. 28% who had been in prison, 55% who had been in jail, 16% who had been on parole, 25% who had been on adult probation, 17% who had been in juvenile detention, and 12% who had been on juvenile probation. To better understand the links between justice involvement and homelessness and drive policy decisions that can reduce the number of homeless and incarcerated people in LA County, the county should review justice data from the homeless count annually, not just as a one-time data sheet from two years ago. This population, as you know, continues to change and we should be getting the right information at the appropriate time. That's why I've introduced this motion, which directs LASA to publish the justice data collected during the homeless count on an annual basis. 
The motion directs Lawson to work with the county's justice partners to improve the survey tools used to collect data on justice involvement. This will ensure that we're collecting the best data to inform policy around justice involved people experiencing homelessness. We have many county initiatives working to address these root causes and we are providing solutions. And I believe that there are many of our partners like the Alternatives to Incarceration Initiative, the Jail Closure Implementation Team, the Office of Diversion and Reentry that can also benefit greatly from the data collected through the homeless count and by continuing to partner with LASA. So colleagues, I ask for your I vote. Thank you. Any others wishing to speak? Supervisor Kuehl. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and thank you, Supervisor Solis, for uh, inviting me to co-author. Um, I think we've all known a long time about the intersection between the justice and homeless systems, but we have never had enough real information to make policy decisions that can best support the population that exists at this intersection. Uh, this motion asks to improve data collection, analysis, and dissemination so we can better understand the frequency of the overlap and pinpoint current knowledge and service gaps in each of our districts and across the county. I'm looking forward to this data helping us better understand, for instance, how women experiencing homelessness have interacted with the carceral system. There was a 2018 Economic Roundtable report that found that 42%, that's almost half, of our unsheltered women who are older than 25 have been incarcerated, and that adult incarceration foreshadows homelessness for fully one-third of all the women. So our annual homeless count, as you said, it's a good opportunity to get this data. And asking LASA to partner with the CIO um, to put together with data from other initiatives like criminal justice data sharing initiative can also be leveraged to get a richer understanding of this intersection. So thank you so much for the motion and, uh, and for allowing me to co-author. Thank you, Madam Chair. Of course, any others wishing to speak? Seeing none, uh, item 17 is before us, moved by Supervisor Solis, seconded by Supervisor Kuehl to approve this item. Executive officer, please call the roll. Item 17 is before you, Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Kuehl? Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn? Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger? Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Mitchell? Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Item 18, strengthening language access and county services held by Supervisor Solis. Supervisor Solis? Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and uh, I'd like to thank Supervisor Hahn for joining me as co-author and all of my colleagues, because I know this is a, an item that uh, is very timely, and I appreciate all the people that called in today uh, in support of this uh, motion. Colleagues, as you know, more than half of the county's population speaks a language other than English at home. And for that, perhaps that isn't so surprising because we know that Los Angeles County is home to the largest immigrant population in any region in the United States. But according to a report on the state immigrants in LA County, one third of all immigrant headed households are linguistically isolated, meaning that no one over the age of 14 in that household speaks English very well. That includes 33% of Asian Pacific Islander, API households, and 29% of Latino households. And almost one in five black residents are immigrants or second generation children. Furthermore, there are over 200 indigenous language groups from Latin America. These statistics should underscore the critical need to expand language accessibility in our county services. There are many services that the county provides on a daily basis to residents, some of which are easily accessible to non-English speaking residents because of translated materials, on-site multilingual county employees, etc. But we know that there are significant gaps that still exist when it comes to having culturally and linguistically competent county services. The simple practice of just translating event flyers and having translations, especially on town, town halls that the county departments host is not consistent and it's not enough. We have to talk about vulnerable populations, 
one of their main obstacles to accessing government services is the lack of in-language materials and county employees who can communicate directly with them. Immigrant communities often disengage from government altogether because of that accessibility gap. And as we are seeing with the pandemic, County services play a critical role in safeguarding the lives and livelihoods of our residents, and we are that safety net. But if a large segment of that population can't easily access these services, then the system isn't working fair for anyone. Colleagues, we have an opportunity to transform and strengthen language accessibility in the services that we provide. In fact, there are six state and 39 local language access policies across 40 governmental jurisdictions. These policies ensure that there are standardized plans that government agencies can adopt and implement to improve language accessibility. The City of Los Angeles recently adopted Executive Order 32, outlining its language access plan. The county needs to do the same. We have to step up. The motion which calls for a needs assessment is the first step, with the ultimate goal of a countywide strategic plan to institutionalize equitable language access standards. We want to marshal the strength of our county departments that most often serve immigrants and their families. We want to also involve our community-based organizations and get public input to access the county's language accessibility and identify opportunities to strengthen the progress we have made and eliminate those language barriers in county services. I respectfully ask for your I vote. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Hahn. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, uh, and thank you, Supervisor Solis, for inviting me to be your co-author. It was just this past November that we authored a motion asking the Office of Child Protection to review the devastating incident that took place in Norwalk to a little boy in our foster care system uh, to see if cultural and language barriers were a factor. We asked the Office of Child Protection to look at the need to expand language services in the Department of Child and Family Services because we know that there are hundreds of languages spoken in LA County and we need to make sure that language is not a barrier to families protecting their children. And this motion today takes things a step further to look at language services in all our county departments. County is the safety net for our residents. We provide services and programs for people when they need them the most. And we cannot let language barriers prevent people from accessing those services. So developing a countywide language access and equity plan will help us understand what needs to be done to make sure that everyone can access our services no matter what language they speak. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, and thank you to both you, uh, Supervisor Hahn and Supervisor Solis, for bringing this motion forward. You know, I, I agree with you. The time has certainly come. Um, I uh, always knew that the Domily Allatory Act at the state level required for threshold languages per jurisdiction in the delivery of health care services. And frankly, it wasn't until the middle of the pandemic when I learned that the State Department of EDD only provided information in English and Spanish. Um, at a time when people needed those resources the most, it was not available in any other language but English and Spanish. And so the county, I'm proud that you all brought this motion forward, that we need to uh, walk our talk in terms of our commitment and our value of diversity, and that includes langu language and cultural competency as well. So I'm very happy to support this motion. Anyone else choosing to speak? Okay, seeing none. Item 18 is before us, moved by Supervisor Solis, seconded by Han to approve the item. Executive Officer, please call the roll. Item 18 is before you, Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Kuhl. Aye. Supervisor Kuhl, aye. Supervisor Han. Aye. Supervisor Han, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Item 19, utilization of homeless housing assistance and prevention round three initial disbursement held by Supervisor Solis. Supervisor Solis. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I too um, am I'm happy to uh, put this motion uh, before forward. Uh, last year, I authored three critical motions to help create interim and permanent housing resources for people experiencing homelessness in the county. In June, I passed a motion with you, Chair Mitchell, as my co-author, to support the Downtown Women's Center Every Woman House plan, Action Plan for Women and Families on Skid Row. 
The plan would bring together county, city, and community resources to house 600 women and 55 families currently residing on Skid Row. In November, I partnered with Supervisor Barger to create an interim housing fund for cities and councils of government to support services at homeless interim housing, housing projects cited in local, jurisdic dis local jurisdictions throughout the County of Los Angeles. Later this month with Supervisor Hahn as my co-author, I passed a motion to provide operating funds to cities within the county that are pursuing funding through the state's Project Home Key Round 2 program to develop and acquire permanent housing for people experiencing homelessness. And Supervisor Kuehl, who authored an important amendment to ensure tribal entities were included in that motion as well. The entire board, I want to applaud you because you've all played a very, very pivotal role in getting these motions through with the ultimate goal of getting more people off the streets and into housing quickly. But of course, these motions needed resources to be implemented effectively. And thankfully, the Homeless Initiative was able to find funding to support all three of our projects. They have recommended apportioning the 16.46 million advance of our homeless housing assistance and prevention round three funds from the state to support these critical initiatives. The motion gives the homeless initiative the authority to allocate the funds as follows. $10 million for the cities and COGS interim housing fund, $4 million for every woman housed action plan for women and families on Skid Row, and $2.46 million to support cities and tribal entities that are pursuing funding through the state's Project Home Key Round 2 program. I appreciate my colleagues, their support, and those that called in today and all the advocates and cities that are joining us in this effort. I respectfully ask for your I vote. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Any other members wishing to make remarks? Seeing none, I, item 19 is before us, moved by Supervisor Solis, seconded by Supervisor Mitchell to approve this item. Executive officer, please call the roll. Item 19 is before you, Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Thank you. Item 20, economic opportunity for justice involved individuals. Implementing the Fair Chance Hiring Countywide Project, which I held. I would like to thank you, Supervisor Solis, for your co-authorship and leadership in this work. The County of LA and its partners invest substantial resources into developing pathways into gainful careers for those who need them the most. The Great Resignation has revealed that there are resignation has revealed that there are now many more job opportunities than workers to take them. The COVID-19 pandemic created a labor shortage that has prompted businesses to rethink their job requirements and the county should be no exception. Too often those with justice involvement who could be an asset to many employers are denied that opportunity due to continuing stigma. And so this motion asks county departments to take a fresh look at the Fair Chance Act and the opportunities it creates. This work starts with ensuring the county and its contractors are doing everything they can to walk the talk. This motion asks for county departments to re-examine their hiring processes to ensure that all departments are in compliance with the Fair Chance Act. It also requests that we review our contracting process to see how we can spur hiring of those with justice involvement in the private sector. We need to change assumptions that lead us to believe that certain jobs should be off limits simply because an individual has a criminal record or that systems involved people don't have the experience or capacity to meet the requirements of jobs beyond entry level. It's time that we be more deliberate across the county about affording these opportunities to those most impacted after years of being locked out of the hiring process, starting with a measurable goal that reflects that intention and holds us accountable. After consulting with our CEO's office, I'd now like to read in a brief revision to Directive 8. After the phrase, quote, focused on individuals impacted by the justice system, end quote, add the phrase, quote, an analysis on current county employment requirements that may result in artificial barriers for individuals impacted by the justice system, end quote. Thank you, and I ask for your aye vote. Supervisor Solis? Yes, thank you so much, Supervisor Mitchell, Madam Chair, for inviting me to co-author uh, this motion with you. 
as you stated, I was a longtime proponent of Fair Chance Act initiative long before I even came to, to the Board of Supervisors. Uh, Secretary of Labor, we created a first of its kind program to provide technical training and apprenticeship opportunities for at risk and formerly justice involved youth. Uh, and with the great recession at that time, those programs helped to improve uh, employment prospects for people with lived experience, targeting high poverty, high crime areas to provide training in demand industries and occupations in their own communities. But now as supervisor, I continue to carry the work as we did at the federal level to create a more inclusive hiring culture in the county. It is really centered on giving those who are able and willing to real fight, to give them a real fighting chance to survive and thrive the post legal involvement. As examples, I authored a motion back in 2017 that established a fair chance task force to promote adopting fair chance hiring practices within the county that included supporting ban the box upon the bill's passage in 2018. Also in that year, I co-authored a motion directing the task force to develop an educational campaign to educate employees and employers on the rights and responsibilities under the Fair Chance Act. And in 2019, I authored the motion to increase the hiring of justice involved individuals in the county. And later that year, I authored a motion to launch the Fair Chance campaign to encourage more businesses to adopt Fair Chance hiring practices. This resulted in a county Fair Chance employment policy, ensuring that Entities doing business with us include standard language in their county contracts and provide compliance with fair chance employment hiring standards. There is research that supports that when people with lived experience get employment, it reduces their risk for recidivism and they have more drive and loyalty to their employment, which results in staying at companies much longer. These are all the same individuals who go back to their communities as engaged taxpayers, they support their families, and their support network. In the board's commitment to care first, it's more than ins an instituting system of alternatives to incarceration. It's about directly investing in communities that have been historically ignored to ensure basic needs to living wages, education, medical, mental health care, and equitable access to all. For all those reasons, I support the motion. I know also that we can expect support from the state as well as the federal government for the kinds of programs that we're promoting here. This is exactly where we need to go. And I believe there is a national momentum that follows. So thank you, Madam Chair. And I uh, respectfully ask for everyone's support on this as well. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Hahn. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, um, Supervisor uh, Mitchell and Supervisor Solis for this motion. I think it's really important that we uh, make sure all of our county departments are implementing this fair chance hiring, uh, not just because it's the law, but because it's the right thing to do. And I've always been a fan of educating businesses rather than punishing them. And imagine there are many employers out there who are simply unaware of the recent changes in the law or are unsure of how to comply with them. So I'm glad to see that this motion includes a plan to do outreach and educate employers across the county on fair chance hiring. And uh, that was my approach on our COVID protocols as well. I wanted, I always wanted our public health officials to go out and educate our businesses and restaurants to help bring them into compliance rather than just jump right to punishment. So I feel the same way here. And I wanna thank both of you for this and I support this motion. Thank you, any others? Wishing to make remarks? None. Item 20 is before us. It's right I'll, next to the I'll move, seconded by Supervisor Solis, to approve this item as revised. Executive Officer, please call the roll. Item 20 as revised is before you, Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Thank you very much. We're gonna move on to item 22, preserving reproductive health access on the anniversary of Roe v. Wade, which I um, took the liberty of holding. Thank you to Supervisor Kuehl for agreeing to co-author with me this weekend. As you all know, we celebrated the 49th anniversary of Roe v. Wade. Our sons and daughters and many of our staff have never known a time 
when this constitutional right to abortion services didn't exist. It felt to many sacrosanct. Indeed, 80% of Americans support legal abortion and only 33% of the public believes that Roe will be overturned. Yet, most legal scholars and the Supreme Court experts anticipate the Supreme Court will indeed overturn Roe v. Wade. The Supreme Court is expected to finalize this position in June. As a result, time is of the essence. Critical planning and action need to happen now and not wait. The Supreme Court's actions could have tremendous ripple effects on us here in California, in LA County specifically. Make no mistake, women in LA County will continue to have the right to quality reproductive health care services, including comprehensive quality reproductive health care services and abortion. The elimination of this right in other states, however, could lead to an increased demand for contraceptives and abortion services by women from those states at our county's public and private hospitals and clinics. The elimination of abortion rights in other states could also result in delayed access to reproductive health care and increased medical complications and morbidity. Since California is indeed a reproductive freedom state, increased demand for reproductive health care could affect our county's budget for health and social services and impact programs aimed to eliminate health care disparities among women of color and young women and poor women, including programs that address sexually transmitted infections. These are important considerations that will have a lasting impact on women residing in our own county and I believe requires our attention. As a result, I'm seeking specific recommendations on how the county could effectively and efficiently respond should Roe v. Wade be overturned. Reproductive health care and justice leaders have spent significant time discussing what the next chapter of this fight holds for those seeking abortion services. Once the Supreme Court rules, women will no longer have a path to assert their full reproductive rights through the court system. So colleagues, I think it's important, particularly for us, I think it's incumbent upon us to recognize what it would mean to preside over one of the largest local governments in the nation during the dismantling of this constitutional right. We, and we have never before been closer to losing it than we are now. I am not going to stop fighting to protect the constitutional right to abortion and full complement of reproductive health care services on demand and will not stop fighting for access to health care services for those in the county who rely on the county for the delivery of their health care. I hope that you all will support this motion to make sure that our county is invested in the infrastructure to ensure that county residents won't be impacted by the very likelihood of others coming into the county just seeking help and support. Already we are seeing what happens when other states restrict this right. Women's health care gets delayed and deferred. We need to do the work now to understand what it will take to become a haven county in a reproductive freedom state like California that is centered on protecting and expanding the ability of every person, regardless of where they're from, to access essential and high quality re reproductive health care. With that, Supervisor Kuehl. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, this is a motion I never wanted to have to have us consider, but I can't say that it's entirely been out of my mind. Um, in 2002, uh, it, it already looked as though a Supreme Court would someday be able to or decide to do away with Roe v. Wade. And I brought um, a bill actually in the legislature called the Reproductive Privacy Act, which embedded all of the rights contained in Roe v. Wade in California statute. And it passed and Gray signed it and it's there now. So this is indeed a reproductive freedom state in its own laws. Um, and I, I think, Madam Chair, what you say is very true, but I, I want to be very careful not to make it sound like we are going to be inundated with people from other states kind of using up our resources. And I know that's not in any way the way you mean it. Um, in the LGBTQ community, we talk about uh, churches or community centers or whatever as being welcoming. And I think that I would like to think of us 
as a welcoming county for those seeking to exercise their constitutional rights if they're denied by other states for doing that. And looking to plan for that is a really, really good thing. I think we should be very proud that we could be a welcoming community. Um, some of us are old enough to remember before Roe, our friends and colleagues driving women to, uh, in, in our case at UCLA, to Mexico. Um, <laughs> in Tori's case on the East Coast to Canada, uh, to and so many others of us. Actually, there's two good movies coming out about that, documentary and a, a fiction film <clears throat> about the women who drove other women to get safe abortions when the United States would not allow it. I, I can't imagine us returning to that time, but I guess, I hope, you all live long enough to see that much of your life's work is always at risk. And so for us to step up here, I think, is really important. I know you all don't need to be convinced, but, um, and it's late in the day, but this is, this is such an important thing for us to do and to let people know that we're doing. So thank you very much, Madam Chair, and thank you for allowing me to co-author and, um, I can't say I look forward to this, but I'm proud to be part of it if we once again have to be part of the resistance. Thank you. Thank you for your co-authorship. Supervisor Solis. Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you uh, to you and to Supervisor Kuehl for introducing the motion. Last Thursday, as we recall, the nation marked the 49th anniversary of Roe versus Wade. And unfortunately, it's not lost on me that this could be the final year we observe that landmark Supreme Court decision. I, like so many of my sisters, have been disappointed by attempts across the country to restrict access to essential health care services that also includes abortion rights. And as the Supreme Court deliberates the future of that decision that has saved the lives of so many women in the last 49 years, I know many must be feeling worried and anxious about their own future. But at the same time, I'm also heartened by the solidarity of so many activists last Friday during women's marches across the country and the world, speaking with one clear voice. We won't back down. And that goes for the County of Los Angeles too. We will not back down from our responsibility to provide essential health care, reproductive health care. Regardless of what happens at the Supreme Court, we have to preserve access to quality reproductive health care services. And we as a county must be prepared for any decision, as was stated, that comes from the Supreme Court so that we can respond by expanding reproductive and sexual health services. And we must do so with the lens of reducing health disparities and long running inequalities that exist in that health care delivery system. So I'm proudly stand with you and support the motion today. Thank you, Madam Chair. Supervisor Hahn, thank you, Supervisor Solis. Thank you, Madam Chair. And yes, it is disappointing that we have to seriously contemplate the possibility of Roe v. Wade being overturned by our Supreme Court in the United States and what those ramifications could mean for reproductive health here in LA County. And anti-abortion laws do not stop abortions. They just make them dangerous. And the states with more restrictive abortion laws have higher rates of infant and maternal mortality. This is a recipe for disaster. And we've come too far uh, in protecting women's productive freedoms, reproductive freedoms, and we should do everything in our power here to preserve these freedoms uh, for people living here in LA County and elsewhere. And we, I love that, that we're actually thinking ahead and thinking how we can actually even help out of state women uh, who might be coming here for help because their states are passing these restrictive abortion laws. Thank you to my colleagues Mitchell and Kuehl for introducing this motion and for asking our departments to take a careful look at how we can prepare here in Los Angeles County. We have to ensure that our healthcare system and our clinics have sufficient capacity and services. I strongly support this motion. Thank you.
Thank you. Supervisor Barger. I'll, I'll make this very quick because I think everything has been said. I agree wholeheartedly with each and every one of you and the comments you've made. And I, I say a motion like this speaks volumes because we represent 10 million people. And what is the stat, Sheila? One out of every, is it 45? live in LA County, is that what the figure is? I can't remember what's the... I think it's one out of every 35, because we're, we're, you know, 10 million and the county's like 350 million, right? Yeah, yeah. so I think that that's an action like this coming from a county of this size speaks volumes, represented by five women who understand um, this issue very well. So I am happy to support this. Thank you very much. So item 22 is before us, uh, moved by Supervisor Kuehl. I will second to approve the item. Executive officer, please call the roll. Item 22 is before you, Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Moving to item 43, report to the Carson, report on the Carson sewage incident and coordination with the LA County Sanitation Districts, which I held. Uh, I'd like to thank Robert Ferrante, Chief Engineer of the LA County Sanitation District for hanging out with us all day. I heard him doing sound checks, so I know he called in at the top of our meeting. Uh, thank you so much to, to uh, the sanitation districts, you uh, and your staff, um, for coming to the rescue of Carson residents during um, a horrific sewage spill in the middle of the holidays, New Year's Eve, literally. I um, want to thank all of the crews on the ground that responded to this crisis, um, fixing the pipeline and, and cleaning up the mess. Um, we understand that the investigation is underway. and. We have a more extensive report due in March, but you did such a wonderful job updating the directors of the Board of Sanitation District two weeks ago, um, followed by your detailed letter to the board um, that we received last week. But we really wanted to have an opportunity for you to present to the board as a whole um, and be available to field our questions. So thank you, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Board of Supervisors, for having me present today. Um, I think you mentioned, of course, uh, I have a brief presentation today, but if any members of the public or anybody would like more detailed information, uh, Attached to this agenda item is our report, not only our report to the county, but our report that went to the state water board, as well as on our web page as well. And on our web page, we have additional information as well. If I could have the next slide. So uh, we're here talking about this uh, on Thursday, December 30th. Uh, at uh, 2 p.m., we received notice of a spill. This is on 212th Street in the city of Carson. It's in the northern area of the city of Carson. And this is an overflow that occurred uh, out of a couple of manholes. And you're looking east on 212th. Uh, there are 15 homes on the south or right side. And two more homes on the ends of the block were also impacted. The overflow, thankfully, was mostly in the street. However, you can see that it did go into the planter as well as into the driveway and the parkways on both sides of the street. The spill flowed into a storm drain, the Dominguez Channel, and then ultimately into LA Harbor. Next slide. Whenever there's a spill, of course, our crews have to go upstream and, and or downstream of the spill to figure out uh, where the uh, blockage is. And this is about a half mile south of that location. It's uh, along 220th Street uh, near the 110 freeway. It's right off the Carson Street off ramp on the 110 freeway. And you can see that here there was a collapse, a sewer collapse, as well as a manhole structure collapse. It's about 25 feet wide, uh, 25 feet long and 10 feet wide. Um, this caused a blockage of the sewer and the flow backed up 
and came out at the low point in the system, which happened to be 212th Street. This sewer uh, is 60 years old and its replacement was being built, but this failure was unusual for two reasons. One, the sewer line itself was inspected December 1st, so just less than 30 days prior to the failure. And um, there was no immediate concern of a failure in inspecting the pipe. There were no holes or voids. There was corrosion uh, of the uh, concrete pipe, but there were no holes or anything to indicate imminent failure. Secondly, um, the uh, failure occurred all at once. It wasn't a typical failure. Typically, with corrosion, a hole will develop in the sewer pipe uh, in the crown or the top of the sewer pipe. Soil falls into it, and uh, over time, that hole gets bigger and bigger. The sewer continues to flow. In this case, this happened over uh, at most an hour or two, it appears, that it completely collapsed and plugged the sewer line. And I'll get back to that a little bit later in what exactly failed. Uh, next slide, please. Our crews, as well as emergency contractors from the um, start, uh, from the time we were notified up until two weeks when we had fixed the location, they worked round the clock uh, if you drove up and down the 110, you always probably saw the bright lights overnight as the crews were working. You can see here there, um, we were not able to obviously excavate and um, remove the plug quickly. So we had to put in bypass systems and uh, pump the sewage around the collapse section from upstream of the uh, uh, collapse to downstream to where the sewer was whole again. Um, so we were able to do that and working around the clock by the next day at 9 p.m. Um, this is then New Year's Eve. They were able to get enough bypass pumps online to stop the spill. Uh, and then they focused in on clearing out the excavation in terms of or excavating out the dirt and all the part of the sewer that had collapsed into the hole. If I can go to the next slide. Our crews then, after they stopped the spill, um, overnight from New Year's Eve to New Year's Day, uh, flushed and cleaned the street. Uh, and this is the actual storm drain that the sewage flowed down to 12th Street into that storm drain and into ultimately into the Dominguez Channel. If you can go to the next slide, it's a view looking then uh, the other side of the street uh, or the other direction to the west. And you can see that our staff had cleaned the street the morning of January 1st. Um, dealing with the residents was a big priority for us. Of course, uh, it was a tremendous impact on the uh, 30th into the 31st. On the next slide, uh, our efforts started immediately to restore the area. Uh, we knew that we'd have to come back and kind of disinfect and clean the street, the sidewalks, the driveways, but we also uh, went ahead and uh, talked to the residents about replacing their parkway grass that was covered in uh, the sewage, as well as on the other side, the city parkway. Here you can see uh, Mayor of Carson on the left there, Mayor Lulu Davis Holmes. She had called me, she wanted to go out to each of the homes. I asked if I could go along with her and um, we went to each of the homeowners present. In the orange vest, you can see one of our public information uh, officers, uh, Genesis Rodriguez. She, from the inception of the spill, the first week was out at the site every day uh, working with the homeowners because besides the cleaning of the street and the parkway, we also offered on-site car washes and detailing for all the vehicles. Of course, a number of them were parked out in the street uh, uh, during the event and also uh, offered to clean all the way, their driveways all the way up to their garage doors. 
If I could have the next slide. Here's our crews out there. Uh, most of the work is complete out at the site. Some um, we're still waiting on a few pavers and other material to complete it, but we have done all the cleaning. So it's just a matter of uh, putting in uh, the materials and completing the restoration of the, of the street. Next slide, please. We were able to repair the sec section that collapsed, and uh, this is uh, Thursday uh, the 13th, so two weeks after the initial collapse. Um, we were able to have the site restored. Uh, the, we uh, replaced uh, essentially 200 feet uh, with a slip-lined pipe. It's a pipe within a pipe that we could put into the sewer, and it's as, um, it's the way we rehabilitate all our sewers. Uh, so it's got a long life. We were then able to notify Caltrans and they were able to open the off ramp. Next slide, please. Of course, with the um, wastewater going into the Dominguez Channel, even though um, it was at the end of uh, the pretty significant storm, there were still concerns about water quality in the channel and potential odors. Here, this is at the Dominguez Channel. One of our employees is taking some uh, water samples. We've been working very closely with uh, the Department of Public Works ever since the uh, odor issues on the Dominguez Channel. We were helping them. They helped us during this time period in terms of sampling and data collection. The good news uh, about the Dominguez Channel is that the dissolved oxygen concentration in the water before the spill and after the spill has remained constant and it has remained above zero. And if you supervisors recall, when it got down to zero was when we had the hydrogen sulfide generation in the channel and the odor issues. So I'm uh, happy to report that uh, it has continued, the dissolved oxygen has continued to be steady, no hydrogen sulfide generation, no odors. That's backed up with uh, some AQMD data as well. We are continuing to do sampling and will uh, with public works uh, through the end of this month uh, and into early February, and we're going to be submitting uh, all of this in reports to the Regional Water Quality Control Board. Next slide, please. So here's a little bit about the investigation. Uh, you can see this is at the time when they've completely ex excavated out the site. And the blue line shows the top of the existing sewer. So the um, top part of the sewer completely broke apart and fell down. But the green line shows a manhole structure. And these two gentlemen that are still cleaning the sewer, they're about 15 to 17 feet below ground, below um, the surface. So um, about 14 feet or so, 15 feet of the manhole structure itself collapsed. And um, that's where the focus of our investigation is going on. And that's where the third party consultant uh, that we've hired to look into it, they're looking at the sewer pieces, the flow data, the manhole structure, all of our records, all of our video inspections, and and uh, we have been looking at other sections of the sewer along this um, segment of sewer. We're also doing expediting some repairs in other sections in an abundance of caution. Um, I want to assure you that we do have a robust monitoring and capital improvement program uh, for the sewer system over the last two decades. We've dropped the number of sewer spills in half that we have had, and our sewer spill number is six times lower than the state average. Nevertheless, this failure occurred. Uh, this caught us off guard, and, and we need to learn from it. And um, that's why we're invest reinvestigating the whole sewer system, and we hope to have, as um, Supervisor Mitchell uh, mentioned we hope to have that final report in March and April with recommendations that we can uh, then act upon and move forward and prevent 
this type of failure from occurring again. We have been inspecting the manholes along the line, uh, and we're, we're going to do some repairs on those as well. Uh, so we're looking not only at the sewer, but the manhole structures as well. Um, and finally, I just want to thank the city of Carson and the county uh, public works staff for their assistance through the incident, the repair, and all the monitoring. And most importantly, I'd really like to th thank and apologize to the residents that were impacted by their spill, but I want to thank them for their patience and understanding as we cleaned and restored the impacted area. And uh, with that, I'm uh, available to answer any questions. Thank you very much uh, for your abridged version of your presentation. I know you had a lot more detail and the additional slides are available. Let me ask a couple of questions and I'll open it up to my colleagues. Um, you mentioned the uniqueness of this collapse in terms of no, no dirt, just the, the way in which it collapsed. Um, I'm assuming it was because of the heavy downpour of rain and we've got to assume that with climate change, we're gonna experience more heavy rains. Do we need to consider the time frame to replace our aging infrastructure? Yeah, that's a very good question. The rains obviously contributed to the failure. Um, that was a sewer and because of the fact that we haven't had significant rains in a number of years, it hadn't seen the types of flow that went through it on that day. And even though the rain was not um, intense at that time, it was the accumulation of rain over those two or three days that leads to all that, uh, you know, uh, ponding in the streets. It goes into the manhole covers and it's very typical. And we saw it that day that the flow was two to three times what we typically get on a dry, dry day. So you're absolutely right. We are looking at that flow data and looking at segments that do not receive, you know, for a period of time, if they don't receive a high flow, that we need to uh, put extra eyes on those and extra tests to ensure when the high flow comes that it'll be ready. Do you have any concern? I'm not sure if there were particular chemicals used uh, in the street and sidewalk cleanup that you showed us um, that uh, could potentially get back into the Dominguez Channel and perhaps impact the dissolved oxygen levels like we just experienced several months before. Do you have any concerns about that? And if so, what was done to prevent that? Uh, that's another great question that, that's come up before. Um, I don't have any concerns because um, uh, our standard practice and then our contractors, we require them to, uh, whenever they're cleaning, flushing, uh, any of the lines, they plug off the storm drain and they recover that flow. And then we put it back into our sewer system. We do not allow that flow to go into any of the storm drains when we're cleaning it or we set up if we're working in this case we didn't have to but when we're working in the storm drain we would dam it up pump it all out so that it does not go downstream finally for me i'll ask others if they have questions just to just to knock me all the way back <laughs> considering what we saw in terms of the size of the hole um eight and a half million gallons of raw sewage can you give me a general cost estimate of of the sewage spill, including the cleanup and the repairs, ballpark. Yeah, even. yes, I can. I mean, between the contractors um, and uh, the materials to repair the pipe, and also throwing in an additional repair that we're doing, kind of upstream of that section, it's about two million dollars right now. Thank you very much. Other questions from other members? Supervisor Hahn. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Robert, uh, for this presentation. Uh, we, uh, who are directors uh, on uh, the Sanitation District Board, did receive a detailed presentation uh, on the events of that day. And so thank you again to presenting to um, our board and the public who's watching. Uh, we. Um, you know, this actually could have probably been a lot worse. Uh, we saw what happened in El Segundo, where there were 17 million gallons of raw sewage that was discharged, discharged from the city of LA's Hyperion treatment plant. 
into the ocean at Dockweiler Beach. But I, I think I said this in the sanitation meeting, I really want to commend you for your quick response, you and your staff. The photos of you walking door to door in Carson with Mayor Lula Davis Holmes and your staff, you know, in your short sleeve shirt, you know, I think the residents really appreciate it. I think what happened was uh, horrible and part of me wants to say unforgivable because of what it meant to the residents in Carson having raw sewage, uh, you know, roll down their streets. But I think your response was right. It was appropriate. Um, and I think the, uh, the neighborhoods uh, appreciated seeing a face of uh, the LA County Sanitation District. The only thing I, you talked about, and maybe just for the public, I see that um, you repaired the collapsed pipe. And um, I think I asked you this before, but maybe for the public that's listening today, is that a temporary or permanent solution? And then maybe if you could just um, touch on uh, your plan to inspect all of the sewer pipes throughout the system and the hierarchy or priority uh, to repair um, things or, or maintain uh, the system when needed. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Supervisor, for your comments. I will pass them on to staff. Uh, yes, our public information office did a great job, as well as the um, our sewer maintenance folks and our field construction people getting out there and working out, working around the clock. And unfortunately, of course, these failures always occur. It seems around a uh, major holiday, so through through New Year's. Um, with respect to your question, yeah, the, the repairs we, we are making now are permanent repairs. Um, and they will allow us, and we will uh, ultimately, uh, by next rainy season, rehabilitate that whole sewer. The original plans were to take a section of it out of sewer, but now that we've made this repair, this will give us a lot of flexibility in our operation and a lot more capacity in that area to prevent future issues. So it is a permanent repair that, we ma that we're making. So as you see, as the residents see our construction going on, those are permanent repairs. Um, with respect to the question of our sewer monitoring uh, system, we, um, so we have a sewer pipe of various ages and obviously the oldest uh, sewer pipe that uh, was concrete or reinforced concrete, that is the one that is susceptible to corrosion. And those we um, inspect more frequently by passing a video camera through. We then have staff uh, watch those videos and uh, look for issues and then rate the sewer segments and come up with a hierarchy of, you know, these have to be done um, urgently, these have to be done maybe, you know, in a few years, and these still look good and have a lot of life. And from that, then we hand the projects and some sometimes we do find have to be done in an emergency. Typically, those are small sections, something has happened. Corrosion is a biological process. So it moves at its own rate sometimes and sometimes accelerates. So what we are doing with the consultant, we're having the consultant look at that overall program and tell us, do we have the right tools for it? Are we using the right frequency? And are we rating the sewers appropriately? And are we getting these jobs out in, in, the, in the time that we're supposed to? And what other things can we do? So, um, and especially, uh, I mentioned that perhaps it wasn't so much the sewer that failed here, but the manhole structure. What can we do about those manhole structures? We we walk down them. Should we uh, be doing uh, kind of um, physical tests on them and other things? So that'll be coming out of the consultant report. And we've instructed the consultant to be as definitive as possible. The more definitive they are, the better then we're able to implement those recommendations. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Any other questions? Again, Ms. Franti, thank you very much. Again, extend our thanks to you, your entire team, um, on behalf of the board and behalf of the residents of Carson, um, that you all showed up and showed out uh, 
to provide them with relief as quickly as possible, and we deeply appreciate that. Thank you for your time today. Uh, this is report is received and filed. Hearing no objections, such will be the order. Moving on to item 55A, pursuing legislative pathways to advance gender parity and policing requirements, which was hailed by Supervisor Kuehl. Supervisor. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. This came out of uh, recommendations made by the Women and Girls Initiative in their most recent uh, report. I'm very pleased to uh, bring this motion with uh, Supervisor Solis. It's not only about advancing gender parity within our Sheriff's Department. It's also about changing law enforcement culture more broadly. Um, we know that women are significantly underrepresented in law enforcement across, uh, well, across the country, across our state, across our county. And we can actually start to meaningfully address this imbalance um, because as you know, the Peace Officer Standards and Training Commission, uh, which is known as POST, sets minimum selection and training standards for California law enforcement. And so by making some changes in the post requirements, um, we can begin to affect this. Because as we found at Metro, where we changed a number of our physical requirements because the jobs didn't really require the kind of <clears throat> upper body strength that were keeping women from certain jobs. We've done the same thing in our own human resources department where we changed the description of a number of jobs so that women felt more comfortable applying because it didn't require things that weren't actually required. And so through post, we can change some of the outdated and arbitrary uh, physical ability training and testing requirements and make them more realistic in terms of what modern policing requires. Uh, we can also add new training requirements focused on emotional intelligence, active listening, conflict resolution, skills very relevant to modern day policing, and changing the training style and instructional methodology to be less militaristic, more focused on you know what we knew about adult learning models. So all of this, um, really the first step is to allow our ledge team in Sacramento to advocate for this. And so what this motion does is to add it to what they're allowed to advocate for. We already have some interest actually in Sacramento in some members of the Women's Caucus to do these bills. Um, so I think we're ready to move these efforts forward. And with CEO Ledge Affairs, the Intergovernmental Relations Team, our Women and Girls Initiative, uh, I think we can do it. So uh, this is just a small step, but a necessary one. And I ask for your I vote. Thank you. Supervisor Solis, would you like to speak? Yes, just briefly, thank you, Supervisor Kuehl, for allowing me to co-author this very important motion. And as the first uh, board made up of all women in LA County, it would make <laughs> sense that we individually and collectively push and advocate for gender parity. Specifically, the motion is in response to a report by the Women and Girls Initiative to look at both training and hiring requirements created by the state's Peace Officer Standards and Training Commission to see how the board could help promote gender parity across law enforcement agencies with a particular focus on the county sheriff's department. We recognize uh, that candidates for peace officer positions are assessed and evaluated, and we need to look at how we could update and revise and be a more inclusive environment. And besides, we need to have diversity in those ranks, and why not help to continue to break that glass ceiling and see more women uh, realize their potential in these very male dominated careers. So just like anything else, I think this is the time for us to move on this. And I believe that there is a lot of support. So I thank Supervisor Q. I thank uh, those women that we're going to call on in Sacramento and, and everywhere else and the advocates that we know personally that have been working on these issues. It's very, very timely. Thank you so much, Supervisor Q. And I too join her in asking you for support of this of this motion. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments or remarks? Seeing none, item 55A is before us, moved by Supervisor Kuehl, seconded by, Su by Supervisor Solis to approve the item. Executive officer, please call the roll. Item 55A is before you, Supervisor Solis. Aye. 
Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Kuehl? Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn? Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger? Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Mitchell? Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll move on to items 55D and 55E, which I've held together, which establish the reward offers for Ricardo Trujillo Ramirez and Tioni Theus. And I appreciate you supervisors for just indulging me for a moment um, as we, all of us, you also have the opportunity to bring reward offers forward in the form of motions. And I think it's an important opportunity for us to not only lend our resources and voices to these senseless acts of violence and murders in our district, but I also wanted to take the opportunity to really acknowledge sometimes the lack of attention murders of people in some communities really get, quite frankly, from the media. Um, it's painful to acknowledge, but true. Uh, several meetings ago on consent, you all supported me in bringing forward motions for Crystal, Crystal Crawford and Timothy Jackson. And today we're talking about, as well as our last board meeting, Latrice Richardson, a young woman um, who was killed over a decade ago, and we re-upped, if you will, the reward. But today's motions on the green sheet agenda offer rewards in the tragic murders of two 16-year-olds. Keone Theus, Ricardo Trujillo Ramirez, whose cases suffer from, uh, some would argue, a similar lack of attention. And these are our children, and they deserve every effort we can put forward to bringing those who were involved in their untimely deaths to justice. So on behalf of the families of Matrice, Tioni, Ricardo, Crystal, Timothy, um, we bring forward these motions. I think it's critical, as all of you I know agree, that we not become desensitized to this horrific loss of life and that we give each case as a county and as a community the full attention and resources they deserve. Uh, so with that, I ask for your support of this motion. Any remarks or comments? Thank you very much. Seeing none. Um, item 55D is before us. Uh, I will move and ask that Supervisor Kuehl second to approve this item. Executive officer, please call the roll. Item 55D is before you. Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Item 55E is before us. Uh, I'll move, ask that Supervisor Solis second to approve this item. Executive officer, please call the roll. Item 55E is before you. Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Thank you. Uh, at this time, it would be appropriate to hear from supervisors on items not posted on the agenda to be pre presented or referred to staff or placed on a future agenda. Are there any specials? I think we took them all up in the meeting. None? Okay, now is the time we'll transition into adjournments. The order of the day will be Supervisorial Districts 3, 4, 5, 1, and 2. We'll start with you, Supervisor Kuehl. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. <clears throat> I uh, ask that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of talk radio host, Michael Jackson, who died on January 15th. He was born in England in 1934, and his introduction to the radio began when he was a student at boarding school during World War II, 
in what became in England as the Blitz bombings. At that time, his father was serving as a Royal Air Force navigator trainer, and Michael worried constantly about his father's safety. Amid the uncertainty, he said he would huddle with classmates in the dining room of the boarding school he attended, fascinated and focused on listening to the radio. Following the war, his family moved to South Africa, where he began his career at 16 years old as a DJ by lying about his age, telling everyone he was 22. His family eventually left South Africa in 1958, came to the States, where he began working as a DJ in San Francisco, then moved to LA to work at KHJ AM, and then news station KNX AM before landing at KABC, where he would remain for 32 years, and he wore a coat and tie every single day to his studio. He became known as the Dean of LA Talk Radio, whose voice graced Southern California airwaves for more than half a century. He was best known for his collegial and non-combative style as he interviewed presidents, celebrities, authors, and ordinary Angelinos, most notably during his reign at the top of local ratings while at KABC AM from 1966 to 1998. His unmistakable British accent was heard by millions of listeners across several continents with his lengthy list of accolades, including a place in the Radio Hall of Fame, a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, and even an honor from the Queen of England. His friendly demeanor and desire for balance in his on-air discussions of news and events stood in stark contrast to the increasingly brash partisan talk radio hosts who rose in popularity in the early 1990s. He was reassigned in 1997 at KABC because of low ratings against conservative radio host Rush Limbaugh before he resigned a year later. Despite that, Michael said he refused to sacrifice his signature civility simply for a bump in ratings. In an interview with the LA Times, he said, I think sometimes I've been overly polite to guests, showing them greater deference but I'm not going to become less polite. Weirdness is such an easy excuse for not doing your homework. He's survived by his children, Alan, Alyssa, and Devin. And I ask that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of actress Yvette Mimieux, who died on January 17th. She was actually born in LA in 1942 to a French father and a Mexican mother. She was discovered at 15 when publicist Jim Byron, as he told it, spotted her on a bridal path from a helicopter while flying over the Hollywood Hills. She and a friend were riding on horseback. Byron landed right in front of them, gave her his card. And so she began as a model before MGM signed her in 1959. For a few years after she was discovered, she was ubiquitous. Life magazine put her on the cover with the headline, warmly wistful starlet. She made eight films before she was 21. She became known as the blonde and blue-eyed 1960s film star of Where the Boys Are, The Time Machine, and Light in the Piazza. In 1960s, The Time Machine, based on H.G. Wells' 1895 novel, she starred opposite Rod Taylor as Weena, a member of the peaceful blonde-haired Eloy people in the year 800,000, who don't realize they're being bred as food by the underground Morlocks. That role and others that soon followed made her one of the 60s most radiant starlets. The same year, she also starred in the MGM teen movie, Where the Boys Are, I almost sang the song, uh, as one of four college students on spring break in Florida. Her character, distraught after being sexually assaulted in a motel, walks despondently straight into traffic. In an interview with the Washington Post about the character she portrayed, she said, I suppose I had a soulful quality. I was often cast as a wounded person. When not acting, she took archeology span classes, founded a business based on Haitian folk art, traveled as far afield as Easter Island, dabbled in real estate. In 2021, she put the Ruby estate on the market 
for $45 million. She also painted large, colorful canvases. She survived by her sister, Gloria, her brother, Edward, and five stepchildren. And I ask that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of Anna. Mila, could I join you on hers, Yvette? Uh, Yvette Mimu, yes, please. Janice, too. Yes, I want to, I was just thinking, I will never, I remember so well her when she starred in an episode of Dr. Kildare uh, <laughs> in the 60s, and she was a surfer who had an epileptic seizure, uh, seizure and Dr. Kildare tried to save her, but it was too late, but she didn't want to give up surfing, and she was, I'll, I'll, isn't that funny? That episode has stuck with me my whole life. I thought she was the greatest actress. You know, she was so radiant. I remember her in Where the Boys Are, which I was of an age to be really affected by that movie. Um, so I, I think, uh, Holly, is it okay to make it all members? I'm sure she'll say yes. Absolutely. Um, oh, thank you so much. Um, thank you all. Uh, and I ask that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of Anna Newman Taylor, born in Vienna in 1933, her family escaped and moved to the United States in early 1939 as the curtain of Nazism was dropping over Europe. She was raised in Cleveland, received a doctorate in neurobiology from Case Western Reserve in 1961. She did postdoctoral work in Paris, had faculty appointments first at Baylor University in Houston and finally in UCLA in the mid 1960s where she remained on the faculty all the way up until her death on December 30th. Her laboratory was active for over 50 years in research in areas such as fetal alcohol syndrome and brain trauma neurophysiology, and only closed with the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. She was a mentor for many researchers in neurobiology across the world and organized several brain research conferences that have continued for many years. She was also very involved in the Jewish National Fund and a range of progressive Jewish advocacy groups. She was an alpine skier and a swimmer up into her 80s. She attended opera and with her husband collected fine arts. There are no survivors. John Harris, I ask that when we adjourn, today we adjourn in his memory. He was a true Angelina, attending Carthay Circle Elementary, Burroughs Junior High, LA High, where he was president of the House of Representatives and the sports editor for the school newspaper, started college at UCLA, transferred to Berkeley, got his bachelor's degree in poli sci and his law degree from Bolt Hall in 1959. After being admitted to the California bar, he practiced in Hollywood before joining the LA city attorney's office where he prosecuted over 500 criminal jury trials and defended the city in civil liability cases. He served as Los Angeles Municipal Court Commissioner for 13 years and was the founder and the first president of the California Court Commissioners Association. He was elected a judge of the LA Municipal Court in 84 and the Superior Court in 98. He was on the court's executive committee, served on the executive board of the California Judges Association. And after retiring from the bench in 2004, he served as an arbitrator and a hearing officer of the LA County Civil Service Commission. He led an active life of civic engagement as a member of the Jewish Big Brothers of LA, the Plato Society of LA, the UCLA Osher Lifelong Learning Institute, Temple Israel of Hollywood, the Brandeis Men's Group of LA, the Laurel Canyon Association, and Westside Democrats. Passionate sports fan, he cheered on both the Bruins and the Cal Bears, the Dodgers, the Lakers, the Rams, and the Raiders in good seasons and in bad seasons. He was a faithful Democrat in his politics and a genuine Democrat with a small d in his values and his way of life. He survived by his wife, Marjorie, and their children, Pamela and Tony. And finally, I ask that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of Olivia Diaz who died on January 15th, a resident and community leader in North Hills East for 25 years. She took part in establishing the North Hills East Neighborhood Council in 2010, served on it until her very last days. She led the group of victorious and successful mothers and advocated for children and families in the San Fernando Valley. 
She led community cleanups, educational classes, resource fairs, three community events, established Children's Day in the San Fernando Valley, where she would gather community resources for families, books, and toys for the children. This year, she was already working on celebrating the seventh anniversary. In addition, she volunteered for several organizations, New Directions for Youth, San Fernando Partnership, Tree People, First Five LA, North Valley Caring Services, San Fernando Valley Dreamer Team, Best Start Panorama City, the Rosa Parks Learning Center, the Mission Police Station, Nature for All, and Census 2020. A busy, busy, dedicated and devoted, lovely woman. She's survived by her husband and their two children. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Hahn. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn to the memory of Arthur Heyman, who was 93 when he passed away. Um, his son, Brian Heyman, uh, is my appointee to my Downey Cemetery District, and he was the one that informed me of his father's passing. Upon graduating from high school, Arthur joined the Navy. He was a decorated World War II veteran who received medals such as World War II Victory Medal, the American Area Campaign Medal, and the Good Conduct Medal. After being honorably discharged from the Navy, Arthur returned to Los Angeles, where he became a radio and television technician under the GI Bill. At one point in his career, he worked for an electronics company that built the very first emergency call boxes installed along our freeways under the contract that was championed by my father when he was county supervisor. Arthur was preceded in death by his wife, Helen, and two of their children. He is survived by nine of his 11 children, including his son, Brian. I also move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in the memory of Sandra Mendez, who was 77 when she passed away. Sandra came from a long line of community activists, including her parents, Mario and Sarah Mendez, longtime community members from Norwalk, and her sister, Maria Mendez Weiss, who was my appointee to our Older Adults Commission and the former Chief Administrative Officer at United Way of Greater Los Angeles. Sandra will be greatly missed by her family and her community. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Supervisor Barger. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move that when we adjourn, we adjourn, adjourn in memory of Ashkan Halif Jin, a longtime figure in the community who recently passed away on Sunday, January 23rd. Ashkan was born in 1932 in Aleppo, Syria. She married and had two sons, Peklar and Vare. The family moved to Beirut, Lebanon in 1969 and later moved to the United States in 1979. Ashkan worked as a kindergarten teacher. She donated funding to remodel a community preschool and sponsored a new chapel for a school. The school was le later renamed the Holy Martyrs ARS Arshkan Palikijian School in her honor. She, is an av she was an avid cook who was well known in her community. Ashkan loved spending time with her sons and with her grandchildren. She survived by her son Peklar and four grandchildren, Alex, Aren, Harag, and Haik. I also move that we adjourn in memory of Andy Bay, Nicholas Torres, and Eric Gullerson, tragically killed in a car accident on Sunday, July 16th in Pasadena. Andy Bay was 17 years old and attended Temple City High School. Eric Gullerson was 16, year old, 16 years old and also attended Temple City High School. Nicholas Torres was 17 years old and was from Monterey Park. They all died too young and will be missed by their family and their friends. Catherine, can I join you on that for Nicholas Torres? He's from Me Monterey too. Park. Me Absolutely. too. Thank Absolutely. You. Thank you. Also that we adjourn in memory of Annie Crawford Polk, a 50 year resident of Altadena who passed away on December 8th at the age of 84. Anne attended Tennessee State University where she earned a degree in health and physical education. She taught health and physical education at various schools. Anne was active in her church, 
community at both Zion Missionary Baptist Church and their sister church, Metropolitan Baptist Church. It was there that she became part of the Gracious Ladies Club, the Ethel Hardwick Study Group, Deaconess Board, Deborah Circle, and Bible Study Class. Anne is survived by her husband of 50 years, James, and four children, Aaron, Walter, Jean, and Artis. And that we adjourn in memory of Merle Henry Banta, a longtime resident of San Marino who passed away on January 12th at the age of 89. Merle attended Washington University in St. Louis, where he earned a bachelor's degree with honors in civil engineering. He later earned his master's degree in structural engineering at Iowa State University. Merle served as an officer in the U.S. Navy. After his time in the Navy, he earned his master's degree in business administration at Harvard Business School. He worked as a consultant at McKinsey & Company in Los Angeles before teaming up with McKinsey Associate Steve Hinchliffe to form the Leisure Group, Inc., later known as BHS, BHH Management, Inc., in 1964. In 1983, he took leave from managing BHH and was named chairman, president, and CEO of AM International in Chicago, a Fortune 500 company with 12,000 employees and 16 foreign subsidiaries. He ran AM International for 10 years before returning to BHH. In his free time, Merrill spent time with his family, who he absolutely adored, and served as a church school teacher at San Marino Community Church. He survived by his loving and amazing wife, June, and their three children, Brenda, Bert, and Bradford. Also that we adjourn in memory of Dolores Higginbottom, a longtime activist and a 50-year resident in Altadena who recently passed away at the age of 90. Dolores served on the boards of numerous community organizations, including the League of Women Voters, the Pasadena Chapter of the National Women's Political Caucus, Pasadena City College African American Advisory Committee, and the American Legion. Dolores was most proud of being a veteran of the Korean War, where she was one of the few women serving the United States Army and one of the few people of color. She will be remembered as a fierce, and I mean fierce, advocate for social justice and equitable education in our community. Dolores is survived by her two daughters, Anne Marie and Leslie, two sons, LB and John and a sister and granddaughter. I also move that we adjourn, adjourn in, well, I'm sorry, so you're going to bring in the um, adjournment for Henry Velasco, correct? All right, Madam Chair, that's my adjournments. Thank you very much. Supervisor Solis. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of Henry Velasco. I've known the El Monte City Council member Henry Velasco since 1984 when I first ran for the Rio Hondo College Board of Trustees. He grew up in Los Angeles and graduated from Loyola High School and Loyola University. He then enlisted during the Korean War and went on to work in radio and television most of his life. Later, he became a realtor with Century 21 and Coldwell Banker. He was elected to the El Monte City Council and then City Treasurer and served for more than 30 years before he retired at the age of 80. He was also an active parishioner in the church uh, nativity Catholic school and helped the students there organizing spelling bees, essay contests, and other activities. Scouting was also one of his passions and he was the assistant scout leader for Troop 552. He also received the Presidential Legion of Merit Honor role by Presidents George Bush, Ronald Reagan, Gerald Ford, and Richard Nixon. Henry is survived by his wife, Teresa, who was also a member previously with the El Monte School District Board of Trustees, and to whom he was married for 64 years. His children, seven, 11 grandchildren, and seven great-grandchildren. He was buried at the military cemetery in Riverside. May he rest in peace. Supervisor Barger. Thank you. Um, I just, you know, Having worked for um, a supervisor prior to being elected, um, I got to know him, and I know that he was very close to um, uh, Supervisor Antonovich and was truly a man of um, family, community, and faith. And um, may he rest in peace. He definitely left this place better. Thank you.
Thank you very much, members. When we adjourn today, I ask that we adjourn in memory of three second district residents, Linda Gomez Evans, Joseph Paco Sr., and Josephine Winston Ramsey. Linda Gomez Evans, a dedicated community activist, was born uh, on November 17, 1982 in Hemet, California, and passed away unexpectedly on the 14th of this month at the age of 39 years old here in LA. As a formerly incarcerated individual, she empathized with all those who had negative interactions with the justice system and understood the need to end mass incarceration. To support her core belief system, she began working with the Community Coalition in 2018 as a fellow of the Community Organizing Fellowship where she worked on campaigns for Measure J, Measure R, and Prop 17. More recently, she received a promotion to Civic Engagement Manager, where she excelled at establishing safe spaces for people to express their ideas, fostering community relationships, and spreading awareness regarding the resources available to those impacted by the justice system. She also was an amazing leader on behalf of all of us in Community Coalition's effort to help educate people about the importance of vaccination, and was the lead community organizer in several of the pop-up vaccination sites that we hosted in the second district. She's a proud member of the Sisters Warriors Coalition, Bail Project, All of Us or None, A New Way of Life, Time Done, Californians for Safety and Justice, and LA Defense X. She will be remembered first as a loving wife and mother, as well as a leader and advocate. She left a lasting impact on all of us who knew her and is survived by her wife, who uh, they were true partners in the struggle, Angelique, two children, Jamari and Jeremiah, her mother Gail and sister Eva, as well as a host of extended family and friends and community leaders, all who will miss her dearly. Joseph, um, can e I join you on that? Sorry. I'm going, sorry, go ahead, Supervisor Kuehl. May I join you on this? Please. I'd be honored. Thank you. Thank you. Joseph Paco, a former member of the county family, was born August 30, 1935, and passed away on the 7th of January at the age of 87. In 1957, he began working at the Martin Luther King Jr. Medical Center and continued for 40 years until his retirement in 1997. In his last position, he was responsible for running the power plant at the hospital. Prior to joining the county, he served in the Navy during the Korean War from 54 to 57. He also attended LA Trade Tech College where he studied refrigeration and air conditioning. He will be remembered as a loving husband to his wife of 60 years and a devoted father. He leaves behind to cherish his memory, his wife, Alwilda, and their two children, Joseph Jr. and Jeffrey, as well as a host of extended family and friends who mourn his loss every day. Josephine Jo Winston Ramsey. Josephine Ramsey was born on October 8, 1929 in Eudora, Arkansas, and passed away on November 19, 2021, at the age of 92 at her home in View Park. After relocating to Los Angeles, she earned an Associate of Arts from Los Angeles Mission College and a Bachelor of Arts in History. She began her career as a teacher at Bethune Middle School, where she founded the Junior Honor Society. While there, she also met her husband, Wade Ramsey, whom she married in 1971. The couple welcomed their only daughter, Joy, in 1974. In 78, she began a successful career as a realtor for Coldwell Banker and continued for 40 years until her retirement in 2018. She took great pride in helping clients, especially people of color and first-time home buyers in the View Park community, the area in which she lived and loved deeply. Her free time, she enjoyed traveling, learning about different cultures, and spending time with her friends and family. She was preceded in death by her daughter, Joy, and leaves behind to cherish her memory, her loving husband, Wade, sister, Rosemary, brother-in-law, Harold, cousins and caregivers, David and Nafisa, and a host of extended family and friends who will miss her wise and witty spirit deeply. And lastly, colleagues, and I hope you all will join me in yes. acknowledging the passing and allow me to adjourn in memory of Sandra Shales, registered nurse.
Shells, lovingly known as Sandy, a member of the county family who succumbed to injury sustained after being attacked while waiting at a Metro bus stop downtown LA on January 13th. Passed three days later on the 16th at the age of 70. Shells dedicated 38 years of her life to the patients at LAC USC Medical Center. She began her career in 1977 for the Diagnosis and Evaluation Unit and transferred to the Department of Emergency Medicine in 1990, where she worked as a relief nurse until her passing. She was remembered for her commitment to Christ as well as for being an extraordinary nurse whose passion for nursing was clear. She was happy to serve in any way she could, whether it was training and mentoring new nurses, providing quality and compassionate care to patients, or taking the time to personally greet everyone she came in contact with. She was also an avid fan of Star Wars. In her honor, a memorial fund was established by the LA County USC Medical Center Foundation, and I requested that all flags outside of county bu buildings be lowered to half staff yesterday in her memory. She was survived by her sister Beverly, nephew Russell, niece Chantel, and her two children and a host of extended family, friends, colleagues who will miss her welcoming spirit and kindness and compassion each and every day. Supervisor Barger. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I would be honored to um, be on this adjournment. Um, I, I've talked to people that worked with her and this truly did epitomize what um, our workforce at our hospitals and especially in our emergency room um, do each and every day. Her compassion went beyond just the patients that were coming in through the ER. Um, that she followed them all the way through their discharge. And I know that many hearts are broken, um, but rest assured that I've heard that they're going to keep her memory alive each and every day um, in thought and deed. Thank Madam you Chair. Yes, Supervisor. Yes, I wanted to also join you. Um, I attended a vigil for her and met some of her colleagues at the site where she was um, where she was killed across from uh, the MTA Metro building. And I'm hoping to uh, get Metro to help establish a memorial for her there, some kind of uh, placement so people can memorialize her. I also understand she was a big advocate for the homeless community and very loving. I um, can't even begin to tell you how, uh, what a loss she is for uh, LAC USC staff, uh, nurses, registered nurses that came and held candles in, in her memory and um, just a loving person. And may she rest in peace and we wanna continue to honor true soldiers uh, that stand out as our heroes representing uh, LA County employees. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, and how about we all join in in this adjourn in memory in her behalf. Appreciate yes. that. Thank you all. We will take all the motions as seconded. If there's no objection to unanimous vote, such will be the action. That concludes today's meeting. Please note that the next meeting will be a special closed session meeting on Tuesday, February 1st, 2022. The next regularly scheduled meeting of the board will be held on Tuesday, February 8th, 2022. Thank you all for participating in today's meeting. We stand